Hey everyone, welcome to another Clean Machine Live. My name is Jeff Palmer. I'm the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. And before we get started, I want to say that this video is for educational and informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. So let's talk plant protein versus animal protein. Now, this is a big one because obviously there's huge differences. Well, maybe not obviously. I think a lot of people think protein is protein, and that's simply not the case. And I'm going to show you some of the research to show why the same amounts of high protein in plant form and from plants does not have the same negative effects as the exact same amount of protein from an animal. And I'm going to show you why. And it's multiple reasons. It's not just one thing. I think some of these were going to surprise you. Some of these you probably already know. But as we get through this, you should really be able to see why plant proteins are so much healthier for you and even provide what you need to build muscle and overall positive health without the negative impacts of consuming the exact same amount of animal protein on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so let's jump into the PowerPoint. All right, I'm gonna make myself a little smaller here so you can see more of the review. So this is the PowerPoint. And the very first thing is a little bit about myself. I uh, created Clean Machine to try to encourage people to keep their machine, this amazing machine that we're born into, the human body, as clean and natural as possible, drug-free and, and based on plants, animal-free if at all possible. I'm a natural bodybuilding champion, a physique champion, master's class. I am a published author, speaker, and patent holder. I have a patent for the first amino acid profile of human muscle tissue as a supplement in humans. I have over 35 years, actually, I could update that PowerPoint, <clears throat> and was selected uh, by Plant Based News as one of the top 100 most influential vegans. I'm excited about that, not because it's an accolade for me personally, but that I could be able to have a better positive impact on more people. Okay, so I'm going to point out there's a lot more to it than this, but I'm going to point out and talk about some of the research and some of the key important things that are really magnifying the negative effects of animal proteins versus plant proteins. So the five key reasons I'm going to be talking about are one, it's called sulfur amino acids or SAAs. There are two of them in the essential amino acid group, which is methionine and cysteine. Now it's labeled methionine slash cysteine is because they're interchangeable in the human body. The body can convert methionine to cysteine and back to methionine again. So they're kind of interchangeable, but they do have different impacts on the body and the body uses them for different purposes, which we're going to discuss later in PowerPoint. Number two, heme iron versus phytate bound iron. Heme iron is found only in animal uh, flesh and phytate bound iron is only found in plants. So there's a very, very clear distinguishment. You cannot get heme iron from plants and you cannot get phytate bound iron from animal sources. So if you're eating meat and, and, uh, and other sources of animal protein, you're most likely getting heme iron. We'll talk about the negative impacts on that and what the positive impacts of plant-based iron are. It used to be thought the other way around. I'll show you the science showing that it's just the opposite of our old thinking. Cholesterol and saturated fat. So yes, there is technically actually a very tiny minute amount of cholesterol in uh, some plant products, but it's so small, it would not have a, a serious effect on, on the human body. Uh, so 99.9% .9 of all the cholesterol, dietary cholesterol that humans get comes from animals. And saturated fat, the same thing. Saturated fat is predominantly found in animals, although there is some saturated fat in peanuts or coconut or avocados. But that's not something that we're eating every day, every meal, all the time, generally. The normal population just doesn't consume that amount of saturated fat. And it's just not as prevalent in the plant kingdom as it is 
in the animal kingdom where saturated fat is pretty much across the board in most animal flesh. IGF-1, what is IGF-1? It stands for insulin uh, glucose factor one, insulin growth factor, excuse me, one. Okay, so IGF-1, uh, more commonly thought of as human growth hormone, but it's it's similar to that, but it, affect, it, it does affect growth in the human body. Now, a little bit of it's important, a lot of it is not good, and I'll explain the reasons why. But our body has a really nice system of producing what's called IGF binding protein or IGFBP. Now, the binding protein does exactly what it's supposed to. It binds to IGF-1 and holds it safe so that it cannot be used by uh, aberrant cells. We'll get into that a little bit later in there. And then finally, microbiome dysbiosis. I'm going to make the microbiome is extremely complex. Uh, there's over 400 known uh, forms of uh, microbes living in our gut and a virome, a whole list of actually some positive and some negative uh, viruses that make their home in our gut. Some of those good viruses actually help to keep us alive, help keep our immune system strong, help defend against other bad viruses. So now we have, we know we have a microbiome, which is your um, microbes, and also a viome, which is, a, or a virome rather, which is a, a series of things. We also have yeasts and other forms of uh, microbes living uh, in our gut too. Now there is a big difference of what that microbiome looks like and turns into when we put animal flesh or animal proteins into our gut compared to whole plant proteins, which are bound to polyphenols and um, fiber and uh, omega-3s. Now these three things have a huge effect on the differentiation of our microbiome. That's what type of microbes, good microbes that uh, promote health benefits for us, help digest our food, break down into metabolites that create lots of positive health benefits or pathogenic, patho meaning disease causing, pathogenic bacteria. I'm gonna dive into that towards the end of the video. Okay, so let's move on to the basics. Um, the first question most people get is, uh, ask me when I uh, let them know that I'm vegan is, where do you get your protein? And that's an odd question because all protein originates in plants. Um, uh, protein is made from essential amino acids. And we call them essential because they're required to build the proteins that we all need. Uh, in humans and most herbivores, there are nine essential amino acids and in carnivores, and true omnivores, there are 10 to 10 or more. Um, taurine being one of the essential amino acids that's essential for uh, carnivores and some omnivores, they are not essential for herbivores like humans. Okay, so all of the essential amino acids are made by plants. Microbes, there's actually a few microbes that can make their own essential amino acids as well, but only plants that we eat are, are, is where we get the uh, essential amino acids. So are there essential amino acids in uh, animal products and animal flesh? Of course they are, because they got them one way or another from plants. Either those plants got eaten by an herbivore and then a carnivore ate them, but it's still the essential amino acids that are made by plants. Plants can make essential amino acids, animals cannot. That is actually why we call them essential, because it's essential for all animals, herbivores, uh, omnivores, and carnivores, to get them from plants, indirectly or directly. In the case of carnivores, they get them indirectly. They get a herbivore to eat the plants and then convert to proteins, and then they eat the herbivore. So the next question would be, well, if all essential fats all essential amino acids, all carbohydrates, all of your uh, starches, all of your fiber is only made by plants 
and pretty much almost every single vitamin except for vitamin B12 and K2, which are both made from microbes, they are not made by animals. There is nothing made by an animal, not one single essential nutrient for humans or any other herbivore. All right, so now that we get that all away, the fundamental question then be if all of these essential macro and micronutrients all originate in plants, why are we taking all of those essential nutrients, feeding them to an animal, and then killing the animal and taking its plant nutrients? Why cycle it through an animal? So we, if you can see on the left here, we take 41 million tons of food, plants, and feed them to 7 billion livestock, and it results in 7 million tons of food. We've turned 41 million tons of food into 7 million tons of food. Now, if I told you, you give me $41 million and I'll give you 7 million back, would you take that offer? Yeah, I didn't think so. But that's exactly the waste that is happening. We are reducing the amount of food that we grow to a fraction of what could feed our population. Now, this is not sustainable. And the World Health Organization and many of the other top uh, um, organizations across the globe are saying we must cut back on this extraordinarily wasteful process. And not only is it wasteful and has a multiple times impact on our environment and the poor animals, 60 billion animals killed every year. And that's not even including fish. Fish is about 2.7 trillion fish are killed. Fish and sea life are killed per year. This is an extraordinary amount of waste and we cannot keep doing this practice. We simply can't. It, our, our planet won't survive on it. But there's an ethical side to this. Why kill an animal and take all of its plant protein? Remember, plants are the only ones that can create this protein. Uh, animals just simply break down the proteins and put them back together like a child playing with blocks. The child doesn't make those blocks. They're made by something else. And in this case, protein is all originates in plants. So why would you kill an animal to take its plant protein? Would you kill a person to take their money? No, of course not. You go out and make your own money. Well, you can go out and eat your own plants too as well. You don't have to use that middle person, or in this case, the middle animal. Okay, but what about all this thing that animal proteins are more effective for building muscle, right? Got to have muscle to build protein. That's what uh, muscle is made of. It's made of proteins. What are proteins made of? Essential amino acids. Well, who makes the essential amino acids? Plants do. So where did we get this cockamamie idea that you, you, you have to feed these essential amino acids to an animal before they are effective at making proteins in the human body? I mean, it's just absurd. It's ridiculous. There's no reason for that. None. Zero. Okay. So this is, is a good study. So this first study we'll take a look at is taking a look at eight weeks of using whey protein or rice protein supplementation on the composition of exercise performance. And the conclusion in that study was they found no differences between the two groups. Oh, they said, well, that, that, that can't be right, right? You know, well, let's try it a different, uh, a different plant source. What about pea protein? So they did a study on pea proteins. Pea protein oral supplementation promotes muscle thickness gains during resistance training, a double-blind, uh, placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trial. That's the gold standard versus whey protein. <laughs> and what they found was funny. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this larger so that you can see it a little bit, is that pea protein actually increased muscle 33% more than whey. Now, how is that possible? Whey is supposed to be the gold standard for building muscles. The key to this conclusion is whey is much higher in leucine. That's where they thought, hey, leucine stimulates muscle protein synthesis, which is true, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But the whey protein is lopsided. It has a real high amount of leucine, which means less of the other essential amino acids are present as building blocks. 
So you can't overstimulate the cell if you don't have sufficient amount of building blocks. Now, this is where it gets interesting. So let's go on to the next. Well, before we get out of that, as they said, okay, but these were smaller studies. So let's take a look at a bigger study. And this is this study called Dietary Protein is Associated with Muscle musculoskeletal, that's skeletal muscle, that's the muscle that we think of as muscle, not smooth muscle like the heart, uh, independently diet, dietary patterns. So they were looking at all the dietary patterns, what you ate, if you ate more animals, if you ate more dairy, if you ate more eggs, if you ate more chicken and fish, if you ate more plant proteins. So those are called protein clusters. Those clusters in the study is clusters of a group of people that ate more higher amounts of X protein, animal proteins, or a cluster that ate uh, more plant proteins. And what they found was there were no association between protein clusters, which means the type of protein you're consuming and any musculoskeletal outcome. That is strength, that is size gains, no difference. The only difference that they did find was right below this, individuals with the lowest amount of total protein intake did have significantly lower lean body mass or muscle. So yes, the more protein that you consume, you can actually add more muscle because the body is not going to add muscle if it can't support it with the proper nutrients intake. Okay, so even the big studies, this study had 3,000 men and women, both genders and ages across the board from 19 to 72 years of age. So all ages, all genders, 3,000 people, no difference. Pretty solid study in looking at what the differences are. So in the two first two studies that I talked about, why use a high protein diet in the plant versus whey studies? In the uh, oh, whey protein study, they used, uh, I believe, 48 grams of protein. And in the pea protein, they used 50 grams of protein. So why did they do that? Well, the, the design was to help neutralize the differences between leucine. So leucine does stimulate muscle protein synthesis, or MPS. So leucine acts kind of like uh, insulin at the cells. Yeah, I'll show me a little bit closer so I can show you what that means. So you have a cell muscle and you have two basic docking stations. One, leucine comes over, docks to the station, says, hey, there's enough amino, essential amino acids present to build proteins, open up and let some uh, uh, essential amino acids in so we can build some proteins. So leucine stimulates that process, just like on the outside, there is a docking station for insulin. So insulin comes, docks to that station, and the body starts to pull in fats and carbohydrates and sugars to use as energy. It says, hey, there's enough energy around here. Let's go ahead and bring those into the cells where we can turn them into energy. So leucine acts as that. So let's get back to the, uh, the study. So if you look on this, you can see leucine in the dark green there, and you can see whey protein at 10.5 compared to pea proteins, 8.4, soar protein at 8.1, and rice protein at 7.3. So you can see the plant proteins have much lower amounts of leucine. Okay, so if leucine stimulates the muscle protein engine to start going and start converting these into it, all you have to do is simply raise the amount of protein in there to reach the uh, optimal amount to increase muscle protein synthesis. So, but if you look at the very bottom here, you see the essential amino acids. So these are the building, the actual building blocks of muscle tissue. And if you look at whey protein, you'll see the column there at the bottom, that's 46 compared to 50.6 of pea protein. So pea protein, because there's much higher rates of leucine. Now, whey protein is designed for a cow. And a cow goes from, you know, uh, 60 pounds to 1,000 pounds, 600 to 1,000 pounds very quickly. So it needs a high stimulation of muscle growth. Adult human beings don't need to grow that fast. But we, what we do need for muscle repair and growth 
on a smaller scale is less of that stimulation that leucine does and more of the actual building blocks. And that's where pea protein beats uh, whey protein. Remember, because the high amount of leucine, you're compensating. If you take more leucine and put that in the protein, you're gonna have less of the other essential amino acids because there's only so much in a gram of protein. And it's just the ratio of those amino acids that's important. Now, there's a couple other amino acids that are really important, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so let's look at the, it's called the leucine threshold. Okay, so the leucine threshold, there's a line. See that middle line growing through there? That line is actually the line at which once you reach that line, that will maximally stimulate muscle growth. Once you go above that line, you're not getting any more stimulation. The body has negative feedback loops that says, okay, that's enough stimulation. We don't need any more. So that extra leucine doesn't really matter. That's where the difference between animal protein, especially whey and the plant proteins can be different. As you can see, the suboptimal line, well, that is soy and rice protein measured there, lower in leucine. But all they had to do was simply increase the amount of rice or soy protein in intake during the day to maximally stimulate the amount of leucine. Once you get there, you not only have more leucine, enough leucine to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis, you also have the building blocks to build the muscle. So you need two things. You need to stimulate the, the cells to grow and you need to give it the building blocks to make those proteins. This is where plant proteins can serve a lot better because you're getting way too much high leucine, as you can see by that middle gray bar there. It's way above the optimal. And remember, anything above that leucine threshold is just wasted. You don't need it. You can't use it. It just gets turned to uric acid and ammonia and flushed out of the system. So that is a waste of protein. And when you reach the right amounts of uh, plant proteins, you can hit both of those numbers, maximal amount of stimulation while also reaching the building blocks that your body needs to heal, repair, and grow muscle. Okay. But what about too much protein and how much protein do you actually need? And the deeper question, is too much protein actually bad for you? So let's start with that first question. How much protein do you actually need? Well, most of the research out there is showing that about 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight is about what we need to maximally stimulate muscle growth. They found that over that really didn't result, maybe negligible, but really didn't result in that much more uh, muscle growth at all. So if you want to do the math, for me as a 180 pound male, that's about, I don't know, 100 grams or so uh, per day. So if I eat 30 grams of protein in a meal four times a day, I'm getting more than enough protein that I need. And that's easy for me to eat uh, in our uh, my four meals a day and easy to reach. 30, meals of, 30 grams of protein is not difficult for somebody who's active like myself. And of course, that all depends on body weight, depends on gender. Remember, women need less protein than men because you're carrying less muscle mass. Uh, active people need more protein than inactive people. And older people, most of the research shows, actually require more protein than younger people. It's because they're less efficient, maybe, possibly, because they're less efficient in utilizing that protein. So they actually need more protein. Okay. But the next question is, well, is too much protein bad for you? And the answer is yes and no. And it depends. And that depends is really shown <laughs> pretty mind-blowingly in this next study. Okay, so this study is called Low Protein Intake Associated with a Major Reduction in IGF-1 Cancer and overall mortality in the 65 and younger population, but not older population. 
which is what I was just referring to. If you're over 65, you actually may need more protein and it does not have to, uh, seem to have the negative effects in the older population that it does in the younger set. Okay, what did this study found? Now, this study is really interesting because one of the first studies I've seen that actually teased out the difference between consuming animal protein and consuming plant proteins because there was a huge difference. They found those in the highest quartile, those eating the most amount of animal protein, had a 75% increase in overall mortality, a 400% increase in cancer death risk, and a five times increase of diabetes. But the same study reported that these associations were either abolished or attenuated if the proteins were plant-derived. Now, why is that? Why would the exact same amount of gram for gram, the exact same amount of high protein consumed in animals have a huge increase, four times as much cancer, five times as much diabetes? Why would it be so different? Isn't protein protein? No, it is not. Why did these animal proteins cause diseases and the plant proteins did not? Well, there is actual differences between the amino acids. Remember, we were talking about the differences in the amino acids for leucine, that being much higher. Well, leucine stimulates IGF-1. IGF-1 increases the risk for metastasizing cancer. IGF-1 is a growth stimulant. If it gets to a cancer cell, it can increase its growth, cause a cancer cell to metastasize and spread. And this is when cancers become lethal, deadly. It's higher in methionine and cysteine. We'll jump into the research on methionine and cysteine. These are the two sulfur amino acids that are found generally much higher rates in animal proteins than they are in plant proteins. As a matter of fact, most of the plant proteins are much lower in methionine and cysteine and why that's an actual good thing. I'm sure everybody's heard about this, uh, you know, oh, that uh, plant proteins are not complete proteins. So that myth came from this comparison that plant proteins were so much lower in methionine and cysteine. So the assumption was, oh, they're too low in methionine and cysteine, and animal proteins are better because they're much higher in methionine and cysteine. We now know methionine can lead to cancer. Cysteine can lead to cardiovascular disease. So lower amounts are better. <laughs> they used to think that higher amounts are better, even calling plant proteins incomplete because of this. I mean, that's so silly. <laughs> It's the truth is just the opposite, that plant proteins have the proper ratios of methionine and cysteine, where animal proteins are too high in these and can lead to disease states. I'll jump into the reasons why in a second. Then we've got heme iron. We're going to talk about that. We've got microbiome dysbiosis. That's disrupting the good bacteria compared to the bad bacteria every single time we eat an animal-based diet. Every single meal even does our microbiome alter because of the food that we put in our mouth. And then finally, cholesterol and saturated fat. Okay, so let's take a look at these amino acid differences again with methionine and cysteine. Okay, so first one I want you to do, if you're watching this, I want you to go ahead and pause the video um, if you're watching it, if you're watching it in real time, just check it out online later. But methionine dependent cancers. So there's a whole group of cancers, lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, the most lethal form of cancer known. They're all dependent on methionine. So we know this so well in the scientific community that we actually call them methionine dependent cancers. So if you look at the study below here, it says a study, a review, I'm going to pull it up big on the screen so that you can see it, I'll remove me, a, a review of methionine dependency 
And the role of methionine restriction, that is reducing the amount of methionine in the diet, in cancer growth control, and even lifespan extension. Yes, you can actually live a longer life by simply reducing the amount of methionine. And it's so easy to do that. Just eat plant proteins, which are lower in methionine, and eat less or no animal proteins, which are rich in methionine. So even in the study, it calls it out specifically for vegan diets. In humans, vegan diets, which can be low in methionine, may prove to be a useful nutritional strategy in controlling the growth of cancer. So we know that these cancers feed on methionine. You can actually take these cancers, put them in a Petri dish and remove all the methionine, they'll starve to death and wipe them out. This actually a strategy for killing cancer cells is to simply reduce the amount of diet methionine in the diet. They now use this for cancer patients, say, put them on a methionine restricted diet, aka a plant-based diet. And sure and behold, many of those people then see their growth halted or even reversed. That's a beautiful thing that you can simply change what you're putting in your mouth and change the way your body is affected. Okay, so let's touch on cysteine. So methionine can convert to cysteine in the bloodstream and uh, in the, in the tissues too as well. And cysteine can convert to a metabolite called homocysteine. Well, homocysteine is a metabolite of methionine and cysteine that converts to a very damaging cardiovascular disease causing molecule, homocysteine. Homocysteine can wreak havoc on your vascular system causing scarification, causing damage, which can then lead to placking of the arteries. When this placking occurs, this is what we call a heart attack, or if it's in the brain, a stroke, or if it's in the leg, a blood clot, uh, or if it's in male genitalia, we call it erectile dysfunction. Th these all depend on blood flow, the heart, the brain, the body, the genitalia, the penis, it all requires blood flow. And the higher amount of methionine and cysteine, the more homocysteine you're running through the bloodstream, the more you're damaging those arteries and blood vessels, and the more chance you have for decreasing the blood flow to the brain, to the heart, and to the genitals. You do not want this. And every time you eat an animal protein rich diet, you are contributing to this balance that can negatively impact the heart, the brain, and your sex life. Okay, so IGF 1. We saw that having a real high amount of um, branch chain amino acids in uh, non vegans couldn't lead to a high IGF 1. Well, why did I say it that way? <laughs> okay, It's because vegans actually have higher amounts of what's called IGF-1 binding proteins. So our body uses IGF-1 for healing, repairing, and growth. Okay, so when you eat, IGF-1 goes up. When you exercise, IGF-1 goes up because it needs to heal and repair. When you eat, IGF-1 goes up because it now has the nutrients to do the healing and repairing. Uh, and when you sleep, IGF-1 goes up. And these are appropriate levels of IGF-1 regulated by our body using IGF-1 binding proteins. So our body will bind those IGF-1s so that we only have access to them when we need them. This is the way the body regulates IGF-1. So IGF-1 isn't swimming around the bloodstream and ending up in cancer cells and causing cancer cells to grow. You want the good cells to grow, not the bad cells to grow. When you stimulate or overstimulate a cancer cell to grow, it can grow wild. That is called metastasization. And about 90% of all cancer deaths are caused by this function, metastasized cancer cells. It's because they're being overstimulated to grow. So you don't want too much of this IGF-1 and the body has a great way of regulating it by, call, by binding it to binding proteins. Now, 
in the diets, take a look at the first study, the association of diet with serum insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, and its main binding proteins. And they looked at almost 300 women meat eaters, vegetarians and vegans. And they found that the concentration of uh, IGF-1 was 13% lower in vegan women compared to the 99 meat eaters. Why is that? It's because women, vegan women, had 20 to 40% higher binding proteins. Remember, this binding protein actually binds to the IH1, keeps it safe from getting cancer cells to use it so that cancer cells can't be stimulated to grow. That is a good thing. Same thing in men. Men had 9% lower uh, than, than um, vegans, uh, was 9% lower in vegans than in meat eaters and vegetarians. So even just going vegetarian didn't affect it for men. It was only when we go vegan. Why is that? Okay, so IGF-1 can be stimulated by the production uh, and the digestion of fiber. All right, so vegans generally have a much higher fiber intake than those eating meat. There is zero fiber in any animal product, in meat, in eggs, in poultry, in fish, in dairy, has zero fiber, none. It only is made in plants and is only found in whole plant foods. Now, you can have whole, you can have plant foods that remove all the fiber. That's not a good thing, and I wouldn't suggest that. Getting those whole food uh, plants in there can help you produce more of the binding proteins to protect you from overstimulating bad cells and keep you on a proper regulation of growth and IGF-1 for the good cells. That's a huge difference in why there was 400% more uh, cancer shown in that study because they saw the IGF-1 rates soaring. That's why they even named that original study uh, high IGF-1 in cause, causing all those cancers in the animal-based diet. Okay, so let's jump into heme iron. Heme iron used to be thought is a much better iron than the plant-based iron. So where did they get that notion? Well, heme iron uh, is a free form of iron, meaning there's nothing bound to it. Heme iron can go directly into the bloodstream. So they thought, wow, it's free. It goes directly into the bloodstream. More of it is absorbed. Heme iron is the better one. Okay, not so much. <laughs> All right. So heme iron is a free iron molecule. What does iron do when it gets wet? It rusts. That's exactly what's going on. Not exactly. It's called oxidation. Oxidized heme iron then becomes a free radical and can start damaging our cells. It can damage our cells inside our body once it goes in. It can damage our cells uh, uh, within our organs. It can damage cells in our um, in our gut. As a matter of fact, the highest amounts of heme iron showed also the highest amounts of colon cancer. That is the number two cancer killer of men and women in the United States. Um, and and there's, there's a good reason for that. It's because that oxidation is damaging those cells. So what about plant-based iron? Plant has, uh, the plants really smartly said, wait a minute, free iron can cause damage. So let's stick an antioxidant called phytate to the iron to protect that iron from oxidizing. So it can't be damaging. This will protect that animal consuming it. So it doesn't get iron that causes damage like heme iron does. Also, the body in heme iron absorbs a whole lot of much, so much so that our liver uh, creates this molecule called hepcidin to block that amount of heme iron. And when it does that, heme iron can build up in our gut because it's not even able to get into the bloodstream. They found that a high amounts of heme iron from eating just like a steak or a piece of liver can cause so much heme iron that our body will try to block it from coming in because saying, no way, that'll be damaging to the inside of our body. Let's prevent that heme iron from even getting in. 
He used to think, oh, phytates, they're bound. So not enough is going to get in. Just the opposite is true. That it's a regulator. Our microbiome can break off that phytate and release it when it needs to. As a matter of fact, our own gut cells communicate sending cell signals to the microbiome to say, hey, cleave off that phytate and let me use it for iron. So it's self-regulating. Whereas heme iron is just free radical, free radical, damaging everything. If it's too much, it's too much, and it just starts damaging cells. This is a huge difference between plant-based iron. Not only that, let me let me uh, make this a little bit bigger so that you can see. So we know exactly the way heme iron causes this. So this first study, heme iron from meat and the risk of colorectal cancer, a meta-analysis. So it's looking at a whole bunch of different studies, a meta-analysis and review of the mechanisms involved. Now, I love this study because it's not only taking a look at all of the studies that are available and then it's drilling down to the actual mechanisms of action, how heme iron causes colorectal cancer, among other things. So read this, heme iron has a catalytic effect on the endogenous, that's inside our body, formation of carcinogenic nitroso compounds, in nitroso compounds. Carcinogenic, meaning cancer causing, and the formation of cytotoxic and genotoxic aldehydes. Cytotoxic means it's toxic to cells. Genotoxic, means it's damaging to DNA. When you damage the DNA, the DNA starts producing cells that are aberrant or cancer cells. So you have the exact mechanisms of action of how that heme iron found in every single animal flesh. I don't care if it's chicken or fish or lamb or beef or buffalo, all animal flesh contains heme iron. Heme iron is known to cause cancer. We know the exact way it causes cancer. It damages cells, it damages DNA, and causes cancer through nitro in nitroso compounds. We know this. We know this is found in only animal flesh. It is not found in the plant kingdom at all. All right. So what about the phytate one? Well, they thought, hey, if it's bound to phytate, it's not going to absorb as much. You're not going to get enough iron. Bunk. That is just simply not true. And if you read the study below, it says dietary suppression of colon cancer, fiber, or phytate. They used to thought uh, that the, the plants were because of the fiber. And fiber does convert into um, butyrate, short-chain fatty acids, one called butyrates, that actually heal and repair uh, and protect the colon cells. So they thought that was the mechanism. But actually, the phytate itself is cool. Phytic acid, also known as IP6, because it's inositol and 6-phosphate molecules stuck to it. Okay, let me uh, put myself up here a little bit. So uh, phytic acid, when it, remember, it can break off. Once that phytic acid is free, it can actually go into cells. Phytic acid is a growth regulator. So it goes into the cell and can take the DNA that is switched on to hypergrowth in a cancer cell and actually turn that back off so that that cell grows normally. So we found that phytates can protect against cancer formation, it can actually help with destroying cancer cells if they're too progressive. So it can kill the cancer, it can prevent cancer, and they can actually go in and reverse cancer, change a cancer cell back into a healthy, normal cell if it's salvageable. If it's not salvageable, it destroys the cell. This is what phytate does. Phytate in beans and grains, this is good. We used to think that phytate was an inhibitor, a nutrient inhibitor. No, it's a nutrient regulator. So you don't get too much. And so you don't cause damage. And so you actually protect the cells, kill the cancer cells, and even reverse cancer cells. I mean, this is about as good as it gets. And it's found only in plants. Animals have heme iron causing cancer. Plants have phytate-bound iron 
reversing cancer. Now, which do you want to put more in your body? Those, those foods that cause cancer, cause cardiovascular disease, cause erectile dysfunction, cause Alzheimer's, or the foods that actually prevent all that from happening. Reverse that when it happens, destroys those cancer cells instead of destroying your life. It's powerful stuff. And I feel like if people understand what they're putting in their body, what the research is actually telling us about the mechanisms of actions, once you have that information, I trust that you are smart enough to make the better decisions for yourself about what you're putting in your mouth. So you don't just coast through life, wait till those disease happens to you and say, God, why did you do this to me? No, that's not, no, it's you that did that to you. It's your choices that did that to you. And once you understand this information that I'm showing you, you can make a better choice for yourself, not point your fingers and blame at everything else. It's you. You can take responsibility and own that decision and you can own a better outcome for yourself. That's why I share this information. I want you to have a better outcome for your life. I don't want you to suffer through disease states like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, heart attack, stroke, Alzheimer's disease. These are horrible experiences. Horrible not only for you, but for your loved ones that have to watch you suffer through it. Don't make them do that just because you're reluctant to change your diet. It's just not worth it. All right, let's keep going. Let's take a look at exercise because it's not all diet here too. Article, Breakthrough Exercise May Stop Disease in Its Tracks. This is a great article. The patient's levels of anti-cancer myokine increased in three months. Myokines could signal cancer cells to grow slower or stop completely. That's quite substantial, indicating chronic exercise creates a cancer suppressive environment to the body. Now, this is really important that they put in chronic exercise. Now, chronic means exercising on a regular basis to a higher degree. So a little bit of exercise is great, but chronic or regular exercise, working out three to five times a week and using um, resistance training or, or strenuous training can make a big difference on cancer, according to this uh, study. Myokines in and themselves do not signal cells to die, but they do signal our immune cells, T cells, natural killer cells, NK cells, to attack and kill the cancer cells. We believe this mechanism applies to all cancers, he said. And there's a study for you. You can look it up and read it yourself. It's pretty powerful. Myokine expression and tumor suppressive effect following 12 weeks of exercise in prostate cancer patients. So this was looking at prostate cancer patients. But again, remember, we believe this mechanism applies to all cancers because this is a broader mechanism, a mechanism that goes after and supports by stimulating our own body to produce immune cells, specifically T cells and NK cells, natural killer cells, to attack and kill these cancer cells. And the more consistent you are with your exercise and the more diligent, intensely exercising, the better your outcomes could be according to the study. And finally, Let's take a look at diabetes. A recent study showed that more exercise may be better at reducing the risk of diabetes. The different effects of lifestyle intervention and high and low risk diabetes, the results of a randomized controlled pre-diabetes lifestyle intervention study. So an intervention is taking a look at pre-diabetes that means people that are starting to get diabetes or have it to a smaller degree and lifestyle intervention, change of diet, change of exercise. So interestingly in this study, it showed the results showed that more exercise, i.e. more intensive lifestyle intervention helps people at a high risk improve their blood glucose and cardiometabolic levels and reduce liver uh, fat content to within normal uh, range. Conventional lifestyle intervention, which is just diet and uh, light walking and stuff like that, was shown to be less effective. 
So regular workouts, intense workouts, putting yourself in a little bit higher stress causes a much greater response of, to body fat, to liver fat, which is where the whole cascade of metabolic syndrome starts. Because when the liver starts accumulating fat, then you get a whole cascade of negative things start happening in the body, which can then lead to uh, type 2 diabetes. So real important, why I wanted to stress the importance of exercise and especially regular and more intense exercise, including um, resistance training. And look, resistance training doesn't mean necessarily weights. You can use resistance training in the water. You can use resistance training as bands. You can use resistance training in weights. You can use resistance training in body weight even. But doing it to a degree, like three to five times a week, with a level of intensity can give you much better health results and much lower risk for negative health outcomes by doing that. So a proper plant-based diet and intense exercise is what I am all about. This is why I share this information for you. I want you to live the best life possible. I want you to make your family proud, but I also want you to be there for your family. Guys especially are tied into this meat is masculinity myth. And it's not masculine to be dead. It's not masculine to have disease states like cardiovascular disease and heart attacks and strokes, Alzheimer's disease. That's not masculine. Not being able to think, not being able to respond to your children, having erectile dysfunction, not being able to have a positive sex life with your partner. This is not masculine. It's the opposite of masculinity. In order to be masculine, you need to be strong and vital. You need to be alive. You need to not be sick so you can provide for your families, provide for those you care about, and provide for those who care about you. That's what I want. I want you to have the best life possible. This is not about a dogma that, you know, plant-based is right and you're wrong. Get over that. That's ego. It's your life. And the propaganda out there of telling you that meat is masculinity is killing you. It's destroying your life. It's setting you up for higher disease risk all the way across the board. And I showed you the science, men and women. You know, it's a shame that we're seeing some of these impacts even greater in, in women. And part of that reason is because we've standardized the diet. A hamburger is a hamburger, right? It's the same for men and women, except women need a lot less protein than men do. So a hamburger is meant to appease a guy. It's not meant, it's too much for a woman, yet it's the hamburger is the same across the board. So we've standardized the protein intake to the men and make everybody else eat it. That's not fair, it's not right, it's not healthy, it's not good, but that's that male dominated society that says you gotta make it right for me, right? Right for the men. And it's killing women now. They're getting the disease rates that we are because we're feeding them a men's diet of higher amounts of protein than they actually need. You can see the impact of animal protein. You can see the impact of plant protein. This is what I want for you to see. Understand what you're putting in your mouth and what impact it has on your life what impact it can have on those who care about you and love you and need you and depend on your support, male or female. We can change our diets. We can control this thing. That's why I share this information. It's why I formed Clean Machine to try to give you the best supplements to help boost that ability. These plants and herbs that just are not in our dietary system. You eat mostly the fruits and vegetables that are in the grocery store, and there's probably a couple of dozen of those that are the common things that everybody eats. They don't have the health benefits of some of these herbs like ashwagandha and, and all these different plants that I'm putting in here that have extraordinary health benefits, way above and beyond anything that we're eating in, our, in the food uh, system in our regular standard grocery stores way beyond. And that's clinically pro uh, proven in published human studies. And I want to give you that benefit. 
I want to offer these different types of plants that can help you get the best results from your workouts so you can get the best results in your health and enjoy your day and enjoy your life. <laughs> I hope this is helpful to you. If it is, please give it a thumbs up. Please hit the like button. Please share so we can get this information out to more people and let people know. Let's stop believing this myth that plants. I've been vegan for 37 years. I turned 60 in two months. Guys, ladies, this is not hard. This is not rocket science. You, I am completely disease free. I take no medications, no drugs whatsoever, not even aspirin. I don't need to. <laughs> I'm healthy because of the plants. You can be too. That's what I want for you. I hope you enjoy this. We'll keep providing even more information. I'm going to do a deeper dive into the essential fatty acids next. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for tuning in.